Hi, Sleep Champions. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever the case might be for you. I know that, as always, in these calls, we are truly an international crowd here today. I am Alex, and on behalf of the Mind Valley team, I would like to welcome you to your Mastery of Sleep Q&A coaching call number one. So I'll be your moderator for this session, and we have a great session prepared for you today. We have very interesting topics that we'll be covering belonging mainly to week one of your quest. And I believe you get a lot of great insights from our time to date. That being said, and without further ado, let's welcome a diplomat of the American Board of Sleep Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, and our very own guide on this beautiful journey towards a peaceful sleep, Dr. Michael Bruce. Hello, Michael. Good morning or afternoon or evening to everybody. Thanks for joining me. I certainly appreciate you guys submitting your questions and being part of this awesome quest. Beautiful. Okay. Like I said, we will kick off with, uh, with several pre-submitted questions. Question number one comes from Francine. It says, what do you look for in blue light blocking glasses? Are there different types of blue light blocking glasses that are used for different situations? Are there any particular brands that you would recommend? The answer is yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I've written an entire blog on how to purchase blue light blocking glasses, and we can make that available for everybody. But the truth of the matter is, is that um, you're looking for, I actually have some right here so I can show everybody. So one of the things that you're really looking for in blue light blocking glasses is the amber lens. You'll see a lot of glasses now with a clear lens, they simply don't work. Um, there's two factors when you're looking at blue light blocking glasses that are important. One is that it has the correct lens, um, the second uh, it, that it blocks the blue light. The second is that it blocks brightness as well. So with the clear lenses, there's no brightness blocking and that's part of the problem. So you really wanna look for ones that kind of have this sort of color to them. Um, I like these because they cover the entire area of your eye. Um, so they're not too thin and then you wouldn't get leak, uh, sort of blue light leakage in under around. So what's nice about these is they cover the entire eye. So there's a big lens and it's no, there's nothing extra coming in on the sides. Uh, remember, these don't have to be particularly fashionable. You're wearing them at night. Nobody's really going to see you wearing them. Um, I, I personally like these. If you're looking for a brand, full transparency, I didn't like any of the brands that were out there. So I made my own. Um, and so if people are interested, you go to sleepdoctorglasses.com. That's where my glasses are produced, and that's, where I, that's the ones that I recommend. Um, you can get other ones, but if you're going to get other ones, remember you want the ones with the amber lenses and that cover your face as well as possible. Um, that way you can, you can utilize the technology. And remember, you want to be putting those on about 90 minutes before lights out. So that allows you to still use electronics, to still read uh, using a bedside table lamp, things like that, uh, without getting that blue light exposure. Remember, blue light is one of the things that turns off the melatonin faucet in our brain, and we wanna make sure that that stays on at night. We like blue light in the morning, we don't like blue light at night. Two quick questions would be, do, do blue light blocking glasses help you fall asleep faster, or do they improve the quality of your sleep? So they actually do both. So blue light blocking glasses, when they block the blue light, it allows melatonin to naturally pre be produced, and the natural sleep process occurs. So all it's doing is it's blocking out the light. And by doing that, it allows melatonin to naturally be produced. So you'll, you will fall asleep more quickly. Also from a quality perspective, um, it will help you get a higher quality sleep in the beginning part of the sleep. Um, after that, it's pretty much your quality sleep will be determined based on your genetics and, and kind of who you are as a person. Do you have to wear these blue light blocking glasses on top of your existing glasses or how do you do it? Yeah, so if you, for example, if you have readers or if you have prescription glasses, you can buy ones that will go over the glasses that will sit in front. So that way, as an example, you'd have your readers on and then you can put these on in front. These are designed to be able to do that. They look a little funny, but there's special ones that have an opening that allow for that. So now I can see perfectly fine, I could read, but I still have the blue light blocking effect. Uh, they also make them in prescription lenses as well if people need them that way. Do blue light blocking glasses come with a prescription or they are general for everybody? You can get them either way. 
Um, it's, it's so you can order, depends upon the company. Our company will actually do prescription. It takes about four weeks to get them. Let's move on to another subject here from, let's go from Nicholas that says, in your course, you mentioned that the melatonin level increases if the body temperature drops. Correct. Therefore, would it be also helpful to, make, uh, to take a cold shower before going to bed instead of taking a hot bath? And what is the difference that cold versus hot showers have on sleep? And when should we pick one versus the other? This is a good question. So, um, so first of all, yes, as your core body temperature drops, your body will produce melatonin. Um, that is a known biological fact. So this is something in our biology. We can manipulate that by raising our core body temperature pre-sleep, so before bed, by taking a hot bath. The question becomes, what would happen if instead of hot, we used cold? It turns out that cold is very alerting. So we never want to take a cold bath or a cold shower immediately before bed because it's very alerting. It actually turns on our autonomic nervous system and makes us very alert. Now, it would seem like, well, if I make my body colder faster, then it should work better. Um, in fact, what ends up happening is you make your body too cold, and then your body has to heat up to get back to where it was. The core body temperature drop is only about a half a degree centigrade, so maybe two degrees uh, Fahrenheit or so, or so. So here's the problem is when we make our body too cold, we go down past that threshold, and then our body has to warm up just to get to the part to cool down. So it becomes a mess. So a hot bath before bed raises our body temperature then allows it to fall. A cool bath before bed forces us to raise our body temperature, which is the opposite of what we want our bodies to do. Now, to be fair, I take a cool shower in the mornings to help make me more alert. So that's part of our morning routine. So for many of you, when we are going over morning routines, you'll also see that I recommend a cool, not cold, but cool shower in the mornings for alertness. Uh, on the same topic of hot cold, uh, Haiti wants to know, can I use the infrared sauna or a normal sauna instead of the bath in the power down hour? So the answer is yes. It's anything that will heat the body um, up about two or three degrees above 98.6. So remember, all of our bodies are 98.6 degrees. So when we get into a tub or even a sauna, we want it to be about 100 degrees, 102, something like that. Not too hot but just hot enough to raise that core body temperature. So the answer to the question is yes, you can use a sauna to raise your core body temperature. For how long and how many degrees? So you wanna do it for about a half an hour, between 20 and 30 minutes, right, to raise that core body temperature. And you only want it to be a few degrees higher than normal. So here's the problem is different saunas treat this different ways and they have different ways of changing temperatures and things like that. So what you would wanna do is get it equal to a 100 degree bath, right? So if you, if you put your body into 100 degree water, that's kind of what you would wanna do. And so you'll have to look at your manual or talk with the person that you bought your sauna from to figure that out. But whatever you can do to raise that core body temperature is gonna be helpful. By the way, some patients that I have will use exercise to raise their core body temperature before bed. Be careful because for some people that can be too alerting and that can make it difficult to fall asleep. For some people, it does make them relax. Now, if you do this sauna and you get really sweaty, you definitely will want to take a, uh, a warm shower before bed um, to, be, to allow you to get rid of the sweat um, because you don't want your sheets to smell and things like that. So you definitely do want to take a shower, but make it quick and don't make it too cold because you want to have your body's natural process of dropping that, that body temperature to allow for that melatonin to be produced. So the next topic is about caffeine in our tea. So you, you talked a little bit about caffeine in one of the days of the quest, but what about caffeine in our tea? Does the same principle apply here? So drink the last one uh, be, before 2 p.m.? So generally speaking, yes, caffeine is caffeine in whatever format you take it in, whether it's coffee, tea, an energy drink, um, whether it's guarana versus caffeine, Anytime that you've got caffeine going in, you want to be aware of it, at least when it hits a dosage of about 200 milligrams or higher. So I know that people have oftentimes asked me about chocolate, and they say, well, is it okay for me to eat dark chocolate after 2 p.m.? Yes, it's fine. There's just not enough caffeine in that 
to make a big difference. Some people will have a tea that's very low in caffeine. That might be fine to drink after two o'clock as well. If you've got about 50 milligrams of caffeine or less in your drink, go, you can go ahead and have one um, after 2 p.m. But the thing you wanna really think about is why. Why do you feel like you need that caffeine? There are many decaffeinated herbal teas that will give you a tremendous energy boost, very healthy for you, all of those different things. So I would argue that after 2 p.m., if you can switch to a non-caffeinated version of your tea, you'll get just the same amount of benefits from a health perspective as you would with a caffeinated tea, and you don't have to worry about caffeine. Great. Another part of this question would be, uh, how about dark chocolate and cacao? They are stimulants, but I've heard that they also help people sleep. So dark chocolate and cacao don't necessarily help people sleep, but they don't hurt your sleep either. So oftentimes I'm talking to people about, um, a, you know, a pillow chocolate, you know, a, a one ounce piece of chocolate or something like that. A small piece of chocolate's not going to hurt anybody. Um, my wife told me a long time ago, if I ever told people they couldn't eat chocolate, she'd divorce me. So <laughs> I am not allowed to tell people that they can't have chocolate. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that there's not enough caffeine in chocolate unless you eat like a three pound Hershey bar um, to really make a big difference. So small amount of chocolate, I'm okay with it. Enjoy, enjoy your little sweet treat before bed. I think you covered this one. What is your view on decaffeinated coffee or tea before 2 p.m.? So I'm fine with the decaf. I don't think there's any, remember, even in a decaffeinated coffee, there's still a little bit of caffeine. Don't get obsessive about it. Don't go crazy about it, right? Just go ahead and enjoy what you do. Just slowly start to become more and more decaffeinated after 2 p.m. And we talk about this, um, I think, uh, in the power down hour, um, as well as our, in our daytime stuff that we talked about this week. So again, I don't want you to obsess about it, but at the same time, you really shouldn't need caffeine later and later in the day. Mm -hmm. And since we are at this topic- As I drink my coffee. <laughs> uh, as we are at this topic of, uh, of liquids, I saw an upvoted questions, uh, question here from Maria. Yes. When should we stop drinking liquids before right. going to bed? So this is an important question to think about. And so first of all, to be clear, if you have diabetes, or your doctor requires you to be drinking fluids all day and all evening long for a medical situation, please follow your doctor's orders to be very, very clear. Now, if you find out that you wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom quite a bit, this might be a time to restrict fluids about 90 minutes before bed. So if your bedtime is 11, around 9.30 would be the good time to drink your last glass of water and also make sure that you go to the bathroom before you go to bed itself. Um, this way you can get some of that fluid out of you. Um, also, depending upon the amount of caffeine that you drank during the day, um, caffeine is a diuretic and so it makes you have to pee. So if you drank, if you had, you know, caf if you stop caffeine by 2 p.m., you're gonna be in great shape because it's not gonna make you pee all night long. But if you didn't stop caffeine, you know, at 2 p.m. and then you were drinking water up until let's say 9.30 and then going to bed at 11, you're gonna probably have some issues of urinating throughout the night. So be aware that caffeine can affect your ability to pee at night. Now that being said, if you go ahead and stop drinking about 90 minutes before bed, you should be in good shape. The thing that I have a tendency to do is I like to wake up and hydrate. And I actually super hydrate. I'll drink 20 to 30 ounces of water in the morning. It's one of the first things that I do. This number one kind of starts your system off, but it also really helps give you a good amount of energy. Many people don't realize it, but just from the humidity in our breath, we lose one liter of water every single night. So we wake up dehydrated. So the first thing you drink shouldn't be a cup of coffee. The first thing you drink should be a big old thing of water. Like to be fair, I had two full like uh, 16 ounce glasses of water before I came on and now I'm drinking my coffee only 90 minutes after I woke up. So I do follow my own rules. I, I know there, there are some people out there who may wonder if I do or if I don't. Um, I do, I follow my own rules. Um, and I'm very, I, I'll tell people when I have a good night, when I have a bad night, because I'm human too. Um, but yeah, I, I would argue that it's good to drink water up until about 90 minutes before bed. Since we talked about coffee, let's talk about smoking, right? Sure. Uh, I, 
I see a, a question from Gotham. It says, does smoking affect the sleep quality or the time we take to go to bed or fall asleep? And if so, how and what should we do? So great question. Um, so the answer is yes. And nicotine is a stimulant. So you should think of nicotine the same way you think of caffeine in that you really shouldn't be smoking close to bedtime. Now, to be fair, I know I worked in an office where we treated many, many smokers, a pulmonary office, where I even had people who would wake up in the middle of the night to smoke because they would be going through withdrawals from their nicotine. While I understand and appreciate that, smoking in general is not a great idea. It's not healthy. It's not conducive to good sleep. If you can avoid smoking or stop smoking with the help of your doctor or friends, I highly, highly recommend it. If you can't and you're still going to smoke, here are some basic guidelines. So my basic, and again, to be clear, I'm not promoting smoking. I'm saying I don't want you to smoke, but if you do, here's, the, here's kind of the protocol of what you would need to do. You would want to go ahead and stop smoking approximately 90 minutes before bed. So that may or may not, depending upon your level of anxiety, change your ability to fall asleep. Some people find that if they stop smoking 90 minutes before bed, they get freaked out because they can't have a cigarette, and that actually increases their anxiety. If you're that person, you can go ahead and have a cigarette about 30 minutes before bed, but remember, it's probably not going to be very helpful for you in general. If you can avoid smoking throughout the night, please do, and if you can avoid smoking right when you wake up in the morning, please do. Um, it will it'll change your whole morning attitude, it will change everything about our, your morning routine. So to be clear, this program is developed for people who are not smoking. Um, if you do smoke again, you would treat it very similar to the way you would treat caffeine in that you would be waiting time in the morning to smoke and you would be stopping earlier in the, in the afternoon. Since we are at this topic with the things that uh, stimulate us, I saw a question from Daniela that said, uh, are we going to talk about sugar and, and its effects on sleep in this quest? And if not, can you tell us what is the effect of sugar that uh, sugar has on our sleep? So it turns out that we actually have a day where we talk about keto and paleo and sugar and intermittent fasting and things like that. So we have an entire day where we will be addressing those. Um, I do have a blog that I created that we can make available. But yes, sugar does have an effect on sleep. Um, one of the things that's fascinating is when you slowly begin to eliminate sugar from your diet, you actually end up having a little bit more difficulty to sleep in the beginning. You get, uh, uh, so for, as an example, if anybody out there has done keto or paleo, you, you remember when you first started, they sometimes call it the keto flu, right? Which is where you kind of feel a little congested, you can feel a little bit weird, your body is detoxing from sugar. That happens for sleep as well. But then the good news is, is that after about a week or so of keto or paleo or whatever, whether it could be um, the wild 45, whatever it is, uh, it could have an effect of making you feel more awake and alert at night. Don't worry, that will pass and you'll fall back into a normal sleep schedule pretty quickly. Does one sleep cycle always stay the same length or does that vary? So this is an excellent question. So our sleep cycles will change, but not by too much. So generally speaking, sleep cycles run anywhere from 80 to 120 minutes, um, with 90 sort of being an average. Uh, I wouldn't worry so much about the exact minutes. However, we do know that some sleep cycles can be impacted by things like nicotine, alcohol, caffeine. So all the things that we talk about not to do during the day, the reasoning for that is not only do they affect your ability to fall asleep at night, but they'll affect the quality of your sleep, which will affect your cycle length. So as an example, if you don't get good quality stage three, four sleep, your cycle shrinks and then your circadian rhythm go, is off. So again, these two processes work in conjunction with each other. So when we, when we were talking about the science of sleep on day two, remember we talked about two specific processes, drive and rhythm, right? If we do something that messes with either one of those, it impacts the other one. So that's something to be aware of as well. There's a good question that's here in the chat. Can I answer that one really quickly from sure. Sharon? Sure, of, course. of course. So Sharon asks a good question. She writes, I rarely dream. Should I be concerned about that? Isn't dreaming when my brain regenerates? 
This is an important question that I think everybody would, would like to have the answer to, especially during this first week. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on her question really quickly, guys. So everybody dreams every night. You don't always remember your dreams. And the reason is, is because if you don't wake up during the middle of a dream, it's very hard to remember it. We generally dream mostly during REM sleep, which is in the last part of the night. So don't worry about not remembering your dreams. If you wake up and you, and you feel refreshed or you, or you wake up and you don't feel like a truck hit you, then you probably had a dream. You just don't remember it. The good news here is don't worry about something like that because generally speaking, everybody dreams. Um, just because you don't remember it doesn't mean it didn't happen. And if you wake up at different times, like by 15 or 20 minutes each day, you'll eventually wake up in the middle of a dream and then you'll remember it. But to be clear, be careful. I can teach people how to remember their dreams, but be careful what you ask for because you might not like it. Once you start remembering your dreams, you will have a tendency to remember all of them. So I really hesitate to teach people how to do this because you might remember not so fun dreams. You might remember scary dreams. You might remember nightmares. These are things that there's a reason why your brain is not remembering them. Um, and so I, I caution people on being careful about this, but don't worry. If you're sleeping, you are dreaming and you are getting that important REM sleep. Here's a question from Monique that says, what is your opinion on phone apps and or devices like the Aura Ring or Fitbit right. and any other tracking, uh, uh, sleep tracking um, apps? Right. To be clear, I've worked with multiple sleep tracking companies before in consulting positions and working with them and teaching them more about sleep. So I want everybody to know and understand that. I personally do not endorse any one particular tracker and there's several reasons why. I have never seen a tracker that is 100% accurate. To be fair, I've never seen one that's probably even over 80% accurate. Most of these trackers have difficulty and here's why. Sleep is complicated. Um, if I ask you how many steps you take, that's actually pretty easy to measure. If I ask you how many calories you eat, that's, close, that's not super easy to measure, but it's closer than sleep. Sleep is a very complicated process. We have brain waves, we have limb movements, we have breathing, there's a lot of complicated factors. And so this is the reason why no one company has really done a great job of tracking sleep. That being said, I'm not as concerned about the absolute number versus the relative number when you're tracking. So let me give you an example. I'd use the sleep tracker and it said I had 14 minutes across the entire night of REM sleep. That's impossible, guys. I think I'd probably have be brain dead if all I got was 14 minutes of REM sleep, okay? Now, that being said, I had the same 14 minutes, night one, night two, night three, night four, night five. This was good. Now, you might be thinking, wait a second, how can that be good? Because the tracker was consistently inconsistent meaning it was mismeasuring my sleep, but it was doing it the same way each time. So there was no change from one night to the next. When there's a change, that's when we have to be concerned. So if I went from 14 minutes to 400 minutes to, to 297 minutes, then I'm gonna be interested in what's going on during those periods of time. So it's the relative data, not the absolute data. So don't look at oh, my Aura Ring or Fitbit or Apple Watch or whatever told me it was 14 minutes. If it's the same amount roughly taught night after night, it's doing its job, you're, you're just fine. It's the variability that you really want to be careful with and understand that. And since we are at this topic of sleep tracking uh, and analysis, we also have a sleep tracker um, in the Quest. And we ah, yes. So we let me remind everybody about that. So I have everybody using a sleep diary, and this is exactly like a sleep tracker, but better. And I'll explain why it's better. Now you might look at this and think, oh my gosh, Dr. Bruce is having me download a piece of paper and I'm writing this stuff in. How accurate could this be? It actually turns out that it's your perception of sleep that is more important than anything else. So when you wake up the next day and you say, hmm, I feel like it took me 25 minutes to fall asleep and you write that in, that's important because it's your perception of sleep that's really we want to see here. Then what's important is as you go from one night to the next and you can see your data, see your data, and you can make your own comparisons, 
This is where you become a sleep doctor. So the goal of the quest is to have you become basically a sleep scientist by the end of this quest. You will know and understand so much information about sleep in general that you'll be able to understand your sleep in particular. Also, by the way, you're gonna be able to help other people sleep well also, but utilizing the sleep diary is the best part of the entire quest. If you do one thing in my entire quest, it's please, please, please download the sleep diary and be utilizing it on a regular basis. Because number one, we're gonna also use it to compare your sleep from way back in, like when you started last week, to at the end. I noticed one question uh, from somebody that came by on the, on the chats that said, hey, I'm not feeling anything yet, should I be feeling something by the, by the end of the first week? So let's, let's address that. The answer is probably not. Depending upon how bad your sleep was and, and what you're doing to your sleep, you may not feel something until the end of week two or even the end of week three, depending upon what your issues might be. I try to address sleep issues based on the order that I felt like most people have them in terms of number. So that's why on the first time we're looking at power down hour to look at what are people doing before bed. Next week, you're going to learn about something called your chronotype, which is going to maybe even give you an entirely new bedtime. And that's where you're going to start to see some real big differences if you can follow the new bedtime and you can follow the directions as strictly as possible. So I don't want people to worry that you may or may not feel anything right now. Remember, you've been sleeping for a long time and probably not in the best habits. So it's going to take a little bit of time for us to get there, baby steps, if you will, going along the way. But I promise you, these techniques work and they work well. I've been using them with thousands of patients over 20 years. We just have to get you there in terms of knowing the knowledge and then putting it into practice. Let's take a few scenarios because uh, I know that we received like dozens of questions, particularly about the sleep tracker. So just yes. uh, quickly go through a few scenarios. And guys, if you have different ones than the one that I'm sharing, I also collected a few from the chat. Would you please explain why the hour slept is calculated from the time you turn the lights off to the time you got up as opposed to the time that you felt that you went to sleep? So what we're looking for in hours slept is basically how much time in bed you're spending. The amount of time that you spend in bed should be efficient, meaning that you should be sleeping during almost all of that time in bed. So later on in the course, you're gonna learn about time in bed and the importance of time in bed. Um, but the, the primary reason is to get used to recording this and have some level of consistency. The more consistent you are in terms of your time in bed, the better the program is going to work. How do I know how long I took to fall asleep after yes. I got into bed? This is a very common question. It's a guess, okay? It does not have to be perfect. And I don't want people, like, there's a lot of people out there who get really obsessive about this. And they, and they watch the clock while they're trying to fall asleep. Nothing could be worse, okay? Don't do that. Turn the clock around so you don't know. The next morning, just guess. I just want you to give me a guess because your guess will be consistent every single morning. And what you will find is as you're getting better and better sleep, it will be taking you less and less time to fall asleep. Don't worry, it doesn't have to be super duper accurate. Just give me a guess because we'll start to look at that over the course of time. Another variation is I usually wake uh, and stay in bed for about half an hour before I get up. In that case- Bad idea. <laughs> what is the wake up time that I put in my sleep tracker? The time I wake up or the time I get out of bed? So it should be the time that you actually wake up. But this brings up a really interesting point, which is a lot of people will stay in bed for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour, hour, hour and a half, watching television, they bring their coffee in, things like that. The bed, it should be used for sleep and sex and that's it, right? And so when you wake up in the morning, get out of bed. We're gonna have an entire morning routine. Let me see which night. Ah, your morning routine is on day nine. So it's coming up. So I want everybody to remember, don't worry, I'm gonna give you an entire morning routine to help you out. Another variation, I normally read for 15 minutes in bed and then doze off to sleep. Would that mean to start tracking my falling asleep time from the moment I put down my book? Yes. So I would say right after you put down your book, it, like I would argue when you turn out the light, that's when you should just 
just write down that time. And that's the last thing that you need to do. Then don't look at your diary. Then the next morning, that's when you answer all the questions. So the only thing you do at night before bed is write down the time of lights out approximately. Again, you don't have to be obsessive about it. Just write down a general time. If you got in bed around midnight or five minutes later, write 12.05, turn the paper over, go to sleep. And the next morning, that's when you fill out the questions. One more. Can you please clarify, quote, the amount of time awake after fir first falling asleep, end quote, yes. that part so, of the tracker? So this is an interesting question. So what we're looking at here is after you've fallen asleep, any time that you wake up, how much time that is. So for example, time awake after falling asleep would be if you woke up for 15 minutes in the middle of the night, or you woke up to go to the bathroom, went to the bathroom and came back, write down how much time that is. Or maybe you woke up and you, and you were awake for an extended period of time, 20 minutes, a half an hour, an hour. That's what I'm interested in. I, I'm not interested in how long you think it took you to fall asleep. That's in another box. But this, this box is just the time after you fell asleep until you wake up. In between any awakenings, we want to know the total time you're spending awake because that's the first thing that starts to lower as you do the program. Since this idea of reading came to, came to mind, I know that in this community we are all personal development junkies. So Absolutely. What are your thoughts and recommendations when it comes to reading a paper book or using a device such as a Kindle to read right before going to sleep? I don't have a problem with it, but what I would recommend is wear your blue light blocking glasses, right? So you're gonna have a bedside table lamp if you're reading a book where you're turning the pages, or if you've got a Kindle, you definitely wanna have the blue light blocking glasses, especially for a Kindle. Now, some people ask, on my phone, if I use Night Shift, which is a, a software program uh, for one of the phone carriers, will that help? Unfortunately not. Um, we, there was a study done at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York, and they discovered that the Night Shift doesn't do anything. Flux, however, F-L-U-X, is a software that you can download, and I, I mention it in the course, and you can use it for your, uh, your laptop, that one works fantastic and really changes the color temperature. But unfortunately, the one that the carrier provided for you doesn't do any good. Um, but if you want to read, and I'm a big fan of reading at night before bed, um, if you're going to be using the table, you know, the bedside table lamp, use your blue light blocking glasses. If you're going to use an e-reader, again, use these blue light blocking glasses. I think that will, that will solve your issues right away. Another part of this reading is, would reading in another room as part of the power down hour be preferable to reading in bed? I'm okay with either one. So if you want to do your power down hour meditation, relaxation, reading in another room, and then go to bed, that's fine. Most people, generally speaking, like to read in bed. Um, and so again, I don't have a problem if you want to do it in the bed. I know bed is supposed to be for sleep and sex only, but this is sort of a, a step down to getting to sleep. So I don't think I have a real, because it's easy. Then you just put the book aside, you turn off the light, you take off your glasses and you go to sleep. Makes life easy. One more here. When is the best time to read before going to bed? I would argue for the, about the 30 minutes before bed. Um, that's probably the best time because again, you're slowly starting to relax. To be clear, you probably want to read fiction, not nonfiction before bed. Um, I'm a, I love these self-help books as well. Um, and what ends up happening is you get really into them and all of a sudden your arousal is up and you're thinking and it's not very conducive to sleep. Whereas if you have a fiction novel, you can always turn it off and turn it back on, right? So I, I tell people, try not to read nonfiction at night. I'm a big fan of reading myself. I read every night. Well, this is correct. I never read fiction. I read only nonfiction. And how I got to over this, this idea of the, the, the brain gets stimulated. And, and it's right. one of these hit that, hits that I am willing to take because I love reading too much. But what I've helped me personally was that I also keep a notebook next to the bed. And whenever I get an idea, a good idea from the book, I yep. write it down. And then I saw that my mind doesn't focus on it. And Correct. It yeah, we talk about that um, in a pre-bed routine, actually, called the Worry Journal. It might be on stress relief day, day 20. I'm not sure. And now a similar question. I saw it multiple times in the chat here about listening to music or podcasts or educational material right before going to sleep. 
what are the disadvantages, if any, for doing this? So the only disadvantage, generally speaking, to listening to uh, podcasts and things like that is you just don't remember the material. Um, so you'll fall asleep because of the, the voice or things like that. So like as an example, there's now a company called Calm and they have these sleep stories that you can listen to. So people are listening, 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 and then boom, they fall asleep. So no, most of the time they don't remember it. So the biggest problem if you're listening to podcasts, which by the way, I'm a big fan of, and I actually think it might be better to listen to a podcast before bed than to actually read a printed book. Um, I would argue that it's actually more helpful. Uh, that's great because the next question on the list was uh, exactly about this uh, from Julianne that says, what do you think about binaural beat sleep music to help fall asleep and sleep stories from apps like Calm? The one right. you mentioned. So I like them both. I wrote a blog all about music and binaural beats for sleep. I'm a fan. Um, there's not a lot of great scientific data on binaural beats. However, so many people love them. Um, it certainly cannot hurt you uh, as far as sleep is concerned. I'm just not really super clear yet on all of the science behind it. There is some science to be fair, um, but it's just not super clear yet as to what is the process. So I think it might be variable based on the individual. Um, I personally would argue um, music with no words, it'd be easier because there's less to pay attention to. So if you like music, uh, classical music has been shown to be quite helpful during sleep. Uh, as well as um, sort of more of the ethereal meditative music. Believe it or not, ocean sounds have been shown to help people fall asleep and stay asleep. But one, one of the things that's the most interesting, and this is just a personal thing that I've discovered working with my patients, is a lot of them don't like something that repeats. So if you have something that goes in a loop, like let's say you're listening to something and then it loops into it again and again and again, that seems to be quite annoying for a lot of my patients, whereas something that's just consistent like a story seems to work much, much better. So I would argue try them both. See which one works best for you. Neither one's going to hurt you for sure. Uh, here's a variation on this topic and a big one also in the submitted questions from yep. Gemma. Before we go to bed, can we listen to hypnosis audios or subliminal programs? Will this affect our sleep? And if we fall asleep while listening, can the brain still hear what is being said? So I'm not aware of any data to suggest that listening to hypnosis or things like that before bed are going to do any harm. So I would argue that they're probably, it's probably just fine. I'm, I'm not convinced that you're going to continue to get the information. Um, you know, back in the day, my son tried to listen to an audio book instead of read it for class in his high school, and it didn't get him very far. Um, while if he tried it while sleeping. So I would argue that none of us can learn while we sleep. Um, I, I would say that that's probably not a good way to retain information. Uh, we have another general topic that came up a lot, especially in the tribe. So this was, what is your advice for people that work in shifts? You mentioned the importance of having a consistent sleep schedule that right. leads to an easier way to predict and control your sleep. But this is a bit challenging for professionals who work in shifts. So how can they use the sleep tracker, interpret the data, and use it to optimize their sleep? Okay, so this is extremely complicated. And to be very clear, this course is not great for somebody who's a shift worker. The principles, the general principles will work perfectly for anybody who's a shift worker. But understanding the consistency and keeping a consistent schedule is incredibly difficult for many of these people because if they work at night, during the week, let's say, they want to work, they want to be up in the mornings on the weekends to spend time with their family and with their friends. And that's where the problem comes in. It's so complicated that we did not include it as part of the quest. And the reasoning was is we would have to create an entirely different quest just for shift workers. Again, that being said, the principles of the quest are absolutely things that you can learn from and utilize, but looking at the consistency and the bedtimes and chronotypes, th this is a very this would be very difficult to implement for somebody who, for example, works from seven at night until seven in the morning. Um, that would be hard. However, they will get a lot out of, for example, the power down hour, looking at their medicine cabinet, um, let's see, looking at the myths surrounding sleep, 
coming up, they would get quite a bit out of paying your sleep debt, and especially next week where we talk about the bedroom makeover. Um, for folks out there who are shift workers, anything that's going on in your bedroom during the day that could be affecting your ability to sleep during the day is gonna have a big effect. So that's gonna be an area you're gonna wanna concentrate on. By the way, for everybody out there, the bedroom makeover is really interesting. I teach people how to pick a pillow, how to find a mattress, how to get rid of light. Like it's very, very practical based teaching you exactly the steps you need to take. Here's another common, uh, common thing that I feel a lot of people have experienced in their lives. Um, is there any advice you could give us to be easily able to go back to sleep if we wake up in the middle of our sleep be it because of a dream, worrying thoughts, or physical pain? So this is very common. Uh, this is one of the most common questions that I get asked is, what do we do if I wake up in the middle of the night? So here's what I would tell you is, uh, first of all, there's a lot of reasons why a person might wake up in the middle of the night. So if you're a male, it could be an enlarged prostate. Um, so number one, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you have to go to the bathroom, you may want to talk with your doctor about the possibility of having an enlarged prostate. If that's not your case, then don't worry about it. There's really a couple of other reasons why this can occur. Number one is low blood sugar. Um, so this is something that I've found only within the last couple of years. So I want to give everybody a trick. And I talk about it a little bit uh, on one of the days, I think, which one do I, maybe during sleep supplements. But um, this is a trick that I utilize for people is if you take a teaspoon, not a tablespoon, a teaspoon of raw honey. So honey that's indigenous to your area. So, you know, if you're in uh, Australia, you want to get Australian honey. And you don't want the kind that's in the bear. You want the kind that's got the honeycomb in the jar. You want to take one teaspoon of that about a half an hour before bed. That will actually keep your blood sugar stable longer. Now, if you're not a fan of honey or you're doing keto or paleo, that's not a good idea. You want to get guava leaf tea, not guava fruit, not guava juice guava leaf tea. You can find it on Amazon for like 10 bucks or 15 bucks. Um, I use the DNA brand personally and I love it. Guava leaf tea. Um, this keeps your blood sugar stable and you can drink this just before bed, about a half an hour before bed, and it can, it'll help you uh, stay asleep uh, qu quite a bit longer. The third reason is that everybody's natural core body temperature is dropping all night until about two o'clock in the morning and then it naturally begins to rise. So everybody has a time period where, where the, it's starting to rise and it's much easier to wake up. Don't worry, that's normal, okay? Everybody wakes up multiple times a night, they just don't realize it. If, unless you really have to go to the bathroom, don't get up, okay? Lie there and relax. Remember, about an hour's worth of rest is worth about 15 to 20 minutes worth of sleep from a rejuvenation standpoint. So even if you're not sleeping, but you're lying there calmly resting and allowing your body to relax, you will be getting some rejuvenation from doing something like that. My favorite technique uh, during that period of time is the four, seven, eight breathing technique. Now I know we've gotten a lot of people questions about the four, seven, eight breathing. So let's also uh, talk about um, breathing a little bit, right? And so breathe, the four, seven, eight breathing actually helps lower your heart rate um, quite a bit. A uh, guava leaf tea does not contain caffeine, by the way. Somebody just asked that. Um, no, it does not. Um, so when, when you're looking at four, seven, eight breathing, you breathe in for a count of four, you hold it for a count of seven, you breathe out for a count of eight. To be fair, many people need to lower those numbers as they start. So some people will do four, five, six breathing. So breathe in for a count of four, hold it for a count of five, breathe out for a count of six, and once after a few nights they get used to it, then they move from four, five, six to four, seven, eight. And that makes it a little bit easier. For some people, holding their breath for a count of seven can be a little bit anxiety producing. Don't do anything that's producing anxiety. Let the breath out. That's fine. This is, again, these are general guidelines and recommendations for people. But I want to make sure people know that's a great technique to do in the middle of the night because it immediately lowers your heart rate. When you wake up, if your heart rate goes above 60, you can't fall asleep. So you got to get your heart rate down below 60 in order to enter into a state of sleep. What about people that are doing a form of intermittent fasting and yes. they do not eat anything before going to bed? I am an intermittent faster as well. 
Um, so I, pr I practice intermittent fasting. I'm a wolf and you're all gonna learn what a wolf is tomorrow um, because you're gonna learn what your chronotype is and you'll learn what the best time to intermittent fast is based on your chronotype. Um, so I, I, I intermittent fast and I eat late in the evenings because I'm an evening person, I'm a night owl if you will. So learning and understanding when you should intermittent fast definitely has an effect, um, number one. Number two, if you're just picking a time, I would argue that eating before bed as your intermittent fasting time might be a good idea, and here's why. Carbohydrates make us feel sleepy and help us fall asleep and stay asleep. When our body is in the middle of a fast, it's difficult to sleep. So as an example, if you're intermittent fasting and you eat only in the morning, so you eat from let's say 6 a.m. to noon as an example, and you don't eat anything in the evenings, it would be interesting to see if you moved your meal time to the evenings and see if your body responds better to something like that. Um, there's a little bit of variation here and people need to play around with when they're actually eating, but I would argue that eating closer to bedtime is gonna be more helpful just because you get more carbohydrates in there. Uh, let's move to another question from Zex. I tend to wake up naturally by 5 a.m. despite yeah. what time I go to sleep. Right. Does, that ha does this have any long-term negative impact on my health? And what do you recommend in this case? So it does not have any negative impact. In fact, it's giving you a hint to your chronotype. Um, I would argue that if you wake up that early naturally, you are what's called a lion chronotype or an early bird chronotype. Again, you're gonna learn about your chronotype tomorrow, but this is actually a really good sign. So if you know naturally you wake up at a particular time of morning, that can be a really big indicator of which chronotype you are, which will be very important for the rest of the quiz. So don't worry about it. it it's a good sign that your body is waking up at a consistent time. And this leads us to a common question. What is more important, consistent sleep time or consistent wake up time? I would argue consistent wake up time is more important than consistent sleep time every single time, right? So when, you, when you're looking at wake up time, remember when you wake up, light goes in your eyeballs and resets your circadian clock. And that happens every morning. If it happens at the same time, your brain can anticipate it and help you get rid of morning fog. So many people out there are taking this quest course because they feel like crap in the morning. The more you're consistently waking up at the same time, even on the weekends, the more you will actually wake up feeling more refreshed and over the course of time have more energy and remove that morning fog. So consistent wake up time is absolutely positively more important than consistent bedtime. What happens if you have this particular scenario, but you don't feel rested or you don't feel energetic when you wake up? So, so help me understand the scenario. So you wake up at 5 a.m. no matter what time you're going to bed and you still don't feel good? Ah, so if that's the case, then I would be looking at what time are you going to bed. I would also be looking at your caffeine consumption, your alcohol consumption, your nicotine consumption. By the end of this quest, you should have some really clear answers as to why you're not feeling refreshed in the morning and some uh, real protocols to help you to figure those out. So don't worry, by the end of the quest, you should be able to figure that out. Another common uh, question we got is from, uh, we picked this one from Maxine. On weekdays, I am usually really consistent with my sleep hours. However, yes. on the weekends, social right. events or other situations may be disrupting this rhythm. What are your recommendations for this scenario and how can I wake up at the same hour every day when I sleep much later during the weekend? I don't care that you stay up late. I do care that you wake up at the same time. So it's really up to you and you being responsible and understanding what your sleep needs are. Some people need six hours, some people need seven, some people need four, and some people need 10. You've got to get what's right for you. You know, one of the things, and I think this is an important theme to talk about, one of the things that people have got to understand is sleep is healing. Let me be very clear. Sleep is healing. So the more you deprive your body of time for rest, the less your body is going to heal from whatever is going on. Our bodies are constantly being attacked 
by antioxidants, by bad food choices, by stimulants, by all of these different things. And we're exercising, we're moving, and we're hurting our bodies, not in a bad way necessarily, but injury occurs. Sleep heals all of that. So by bifurcating or making the hours of your sleep less, all you're doing is giving your body less of a chance to heal. Why would you do that? Right? Like, I don't understand why you would do that. I get it if you're young and you want to stay out late and party, but you got to wake up at the same time and don't take any naps during the day if you can possibly avoid it. Because again, you want this consistency in your sleep schedule. The reason you're taking a sleep quest is to improve your sleep. It's very difficult to improve your sleep if you're going to bed at three o'clock in the morning. Is this a personalized quest? So what we mean by personalized is that we're gonna teach you what your chronotype is. And that way you will go down a particular protocol based on your chronotype. That is what we mean by personalized. This is not a sleep course for people with personality disorders. That is a mental health situation which is very, very different. People with personality disorders can absolutely take the course and they can absolutely get a great night's sleep. But I do not address personality disorders and sleep. Also, I do not address mental health issues in sleep like depression or anxiety. Both of those, for example, will affect sleep in various ways. Um, there's a lot of information on my blog that we can ha uh, have available to you. If you go to my website, thesleepdoctor.com, you go into blogs, if you type in personality disorders or depression or anxiety, there is a ton of information in there that I think you'll find valuable. But again, when we say personalized, that does not mean that we are talking about personality disorders, but rather a personalized chronotype to you. So let's fire a couple of other ones, Alex. Let's do it. Wonderful. Uh, let's go this one from Melody. It can take me a while, over one hour, to fall asleep when I first yes. get into bed because I cannot turn off the thoughts in my mind. What can Absolutely. I do to fall asleep more quickly? So this is the crux of the program. And we teach you, I teach you several different techniques of what to do. They are all coming up. Part of it has to do with understanding what your chronotype is. So if when somebody goes to bed and they can't fall asleep for an hour or two, they're probably a night owl and they're going to bed too early. So that's certainly one of the things that I talk about with people all the time. So starting tomorrow, you're gonna to realize a little bit more about your chronotype and that may give you some insight as to why it's taking so long for you to fall asleep. I know it seems completely counterintuitive. Like I tell insomniacs all the time, you're going to bed too early. Many people who have insomnia tell me, if I get in bed early, I cross my fingers and hope that I'm gonna fall asleep and catch up on some of my sleep. What you should have learned during the science of sleep uh, course is that, that that logic doesn't make any sense. Your body is set on a circadian rhythm and will be ready for bed when your body is genetically ready. It, will, it doesn't matter oftentimes what time you get in the bed, it's not gonna help out. So please, please, please understand that just because you're not falling asleep doesn't mean that you won't fall asleep. Once you learn what your chronotype is, it should help you quite a bit. What if, you work, what if your work does not permit you to have the same power down hour every week or every day of the week? So then you really need to start looking at um, the, early, uh, the latest power down hour that you can have, and you can also truncate it. So let's say that one night you don't have a full hour, you can make it a half an hour, right? So in the power down hour, I say take 20 minutes for stuff you got to do, 20 minutes for hygiene, and 20 minutes for prayer, meditation, relaxation. If you don't have that amount of time, you can do 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Or you can even do five minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes. So this is a variation on the theme where you do five minutes to get stuff done, five minutes for hygiene, so you brush your teeth, wash your face fairly quickly, and then 20 minutes of some form of meditation or relaxation. That should be quite happy, uh, quite helpful rather. Regarding the medicine cabinet that we discussed this week, does yes. vitamin D impact sleep quality? And if yes, what's the best time to take vitamin D? Yes, it absolutely positively affects uh, sleep quality. In fact, vitamin D, I wrote an entire article about vitamin D, um, and we can make that available for you guys as well. Um, it affects circadian rhythm, so telling your body when to sleep. I personally find vitamin D gives me energy, so I took some this morning. I, you need to ask your doctor what the appropriate dosage is for you because it's going to change based on gender 
and based on age. My personal, what I do each morning is I take 5,000 international units in a very small gel cap each morning, along with uh, my magnesium supplements. Uh, many of you, by the way, will start taking magnesium at the end of the day, not the beginning of the day. There are different reasons for both. Um, but strictly looking at vitamin D, I recommend a morning dose. And again, talk with your doctor to see what's good. I personally use 5,000 international units each morning. Are there any other specific stimulants that we should be looking for in our medicine cabinet or our medicine or supplements uh, other than caffeine? So actually, yes. And so one of the things that I talk about with people all the time is something called guarana. So many people don't know this, but guarana is equally as powerful, if not more powerful than caffeine. So if you're taking an herbal supplement, you want to make sure that it doesn't have that in it as well, if you're looking in your medicine cabinet. More importantly, if you're taking a prescription medication, you need to look up the side effects because in many cases, insomnia is a side effect of taking a medication. An example here would be um, the serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors. So for example, depression medication like Zoloft, Prozac, things like that. It's a well-known fact that those almost completely knock out REM sleep. People who take those drugs have almost no REM sleep. And again, people have been taking these drugs for years and years and years. So you need to be careful. Do not, I repeat, do not stop these drugs cold turkey and do not stop medication without speaking to your doctor. But do ask your doctor, are any of the medications I'm on affecting my sleep or my sleep quality? Because that's one of the things obviously you want to learn about. Speaking of drugs, um, you mentioned alcohol and caffeine, but yes. what are your thoughts on CBD and weed or marijuana? Yes, absolutely. So depending upon what part of the world you're in, and if you're in the United States, which state you're in, uh, marijuana is legal recreationally. I live in California. And so one of the things I tell people all the time is you need to really think through the idea of sleep and THC. Um, I would argue that you would need a tremendous amount of CBD only in order to have a large effect on your sleep. THC, a small amount, seems to help accelerate the, the CBD and help get you there. So one of the things that we know for a lot of people is they have pre-bed anxiety, meaning they're worried about going to sleep, they get in bed, they can't turn off their brain, uh, something that we've already asked a, a started a question about. THC seems to help quite a bit with that. But the key factor is we don't want people to get stoned. We don't want people to get uh, you know, too high or have too much of a psychedelic effect. So we wanna have a small amount of THC and a larger amount of CBD if you're going to be doing that. I actually wrote an entire blog on if you're gonna be using cannabis for sleep, what to look for, so we can make that available to you as well. Or go over to my website, thesleepdoctor.com, and punch it into the blogs. You'll find more information than you know what to do with. Awesome. Let's go with one more question. Um, if you eat close to bedtime, they say, they say it would interfere with the energy the body needs to repair itself. So what are your thoughts to towards eating close to bedtime? I'm a fan of eating uh, within, but I'm not a fan of eating right before bed. So, uh, but I do like bedtime snacks. So let's say you have dinner at seven o'clock, you're done by eight, and you don't go to bed until midnight, right? Well, it's not a bad idea to probably have something small just before bed. I would argue that a 250 calorie snack, 70% carbohydrates, 30% fat or protein would probably be the best thing that you could do uh, to have a snack at night. Something like that might be an apple with some nut butter, uh, cheese and crackers, even oatmeal with some dried cherries on top, things like that. Again, 250 calories, so something small. Uh, would probably be the best thing that you could possibly have. And you don't want to go to bed hungry, but you don't want to go to bed on a full stomach either. So somewhere in between. Awesome. I think we can, uh, we can probably stop at this point. So thank you very much, Michael, for bringing your definite yeah. A-game for this call and all of your valuable insights. Absolutely. And if people want, um, they can go to the, my website. And uh, there's already somebody who's posted a couple of links here in the chat, that's an awesome idea. Feel free to check it out. You might be surprised. There's a, I've literally written over 800 blogs 
So almost any question that you could imagine, you'll find answered there. Happy to continue to do these. I really appreciate so many people coming online. Uh, I've done these before and only gotten 20 or 30 people. And I love the Mind Valley community because you guys are so attentive. You're so interested. I can't thank you, thank you, thank you enough. You know, this is awesome. I promise you will see me next week. Keep going on the quest. Keep going on the course. Our goal here is to get everybody to sleep better. I'm going to be doing it with you. So keep it up. Tell your friends. I promise you're going to learn a ton and have fun. That's all for me. All there's left to say is stay committed, guys. Continue to work on the piece that's on in front of you. And little by little, you will become sleep champions. So thank you very much for all of your questions, your comments, your engagement, your participation, for showing up and for playing full out. And until our next session, be extraordinary, my friends. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank mm-hmm. you.